Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation to this conference. Um, I, I would have been very glad to be here. In fact, it's slightly odd because I'm recording this ahead of time, but um, I look forward to enjoying the conference, at least virtually. So what I want to talk about is, is how we can understand adaptation in what I call an infinitesimal world. And I hope what I mean by this will become clear. So I want to contrast two views of biology. Um, one, which I think is the view that dominates both evolutionary and molecular biology, is the view that evolution adaptation happen one gene at a time. Um, and in contrast, there's the very successful view in quantitative genetics, which looks back at variation in populations, looks at the change under selection as being due to the statistical consequences of variation determined by very, very many genes, variation spread essentially over the whole genome. And what I'll do is contrast these views and develop the, I think, less prominent view, what I call the infinitesimal worldview, that genetic variation is actually spread over the whole genome through very many variants of small effect. And then at the end, just raise the question of, of what this view should mean, particularly what its consequences might be for how we see organismal function in general and how we actually investigate that function. Now, we generally think of adaptation as going by selection on individual mutations. A mutation arises, it increases fitness, it has some chance of getting established in the population and perhaps fixing. And we have, of course, many examples of this very simple um, adaptation, pesticide resistance, perhaps being the most obvious, uh, melanism in the peppered moth, which was the first uh, case where JBS Haldane estimated selection in a natural population and many, many others. We typically you know, think of certain kinds of traits as involving this kind of uh, major gene evolution, involving pigmentation, involving uh, pesticide resistance, things where there's an obvious target gene and so on. And we often see that in these cases, certain loci are repeatedly involved. And these are very prominent in the field because they're relatively easy to study. And perhaps in a, in a similar way, molecular biology advances gene by gene. We, uh, in classical genetics, going back 100 years, more than 100 years now, um, classical genetics depended on major mutations that were often knocking out gene function, producing a major phenotypic effect. And we could, in fact, only detect genes that could be, um, could be knocked out in this way to produce a major phenotype. And you know, this is still obviously a major uh, set of methodologies in molecular genetics. And more generally, we think of advancing by understanding the detailed structure of networks, how this gene interacts with this gene, how this protein binds to this protein, and so on. And yet, in contrast with this, quantitative genetics has developed in, in parallel and very successfully, and it's responsible for probably the most successful predictions in biology and the most practically important predictions, um, allowing us to produce dramatic improvements in crop yields, in uh, you know, yields from uh, plant and animal breeding. And interestingly, about 20, 25 years ago, when uh, DNA sequence information became available, the idea had been that the statistical approach of quantitative genetics would rapidly become outmoded. We would be able to identify the genes responsible for the traits we're interested in, identify those genes, manipulate them, and produce you know, the perfect cow or whatever. And it turns out that wasn't possible. I mean, we can identify genes that affect traits, but they are typically, as we'll see, don't account for that much of the variation. And even when we identify them, their effects are so small that we can't usefully manipulate them. And so instead, sequences are used, they've been very important, they've more or less been responsible for doubling the rate of improvement of milk yield, but in a statistical sense. So there's a, a method called genomic selection, which essentially uses the sequence information to make better predictions about relationships, the actual genetic relationship, the amount of genetic material coming from this individual or that individual. And this allows more accurate statistical predictions of the breeding value. And that's what we want to know. We want to choose to breed from bulls whose daughters will be predicted to have the highest milk yield. And so this has been very successful, but it succeeded without making any uh, precise identifications of causal loci. 
And we're entering you know, the same sort of era perhaps in human genetics where you know, the dream has been to find those genes responsible for high blood pressure or whatever, disease risk in general, but maybe the most immediate application will be simply to predict disease risk and use that to, to modify treatment regimes. So at any rate, quantitative genetics assumes highly polygenic variation, polygenic just meaning very large numbers of uh, loci responsible. And we've really known since the beginning of classical genetics that this, this has to be the case for complex traits, because we know that if we select on more or less any trait in any sexual outcross population, we'll get a continued response. And you know, the, the most heroic experiments lasting for a hundred generations or more have seen a steady increase. As long as the population is sufficiently large, there'll be a continued response to selection. And that necessarily implies that the variation is based on large numbers of genes of small effect. If there are a few genes with large effect that will be fixed in the population very quickly, everything will grind to a halt. And recently, we've had this confirmed very dramatically by genome-wide association studies, um, the largest being for traits such as human height, uh, where you know, in enormous samples of half a million or more people, the variance in uh, height, the inherited variants can be attributed to specific SNPs, specific single nucleotide polymorphisms, but there are huge numbers of these. And so, uh, you know, the largest of these accounts for of the order of a few percent of the genetic variants. And in order to account for half the genetic variants, tens of thousands of SNPs are needed. So with we're seeing a justification, a validation of what's been known as the infinitesimal model. And I'll explain more about this in a bit. Um, and crucially, this infinitesimal model implies that the underlying alleles are close to neutral, that they are affected by selection, but they're affected by drift as much or more. Okay. So how do we reconcile these different views? The, the single gene view, the, the dominant view, I think, versus the quantitative genetic view. And indeed, can we reconcile them? Can we you know, fulfill our dreams of being able to simply look at samples of DNA sequences and identify the sites in the genome which are under selection? Can we relate short-term evolution to long-term adaptation? In other words, we look at, we study populations over tens or even hundreds of generations in the lab or in uh, short-term sort of field studies. And we think we understand what's happening there, but our viewpoint is very different from what we do look at when we compare species, where we identify substitutions at you know, very large numbers of, of sites. What is the relation between these two? How can we connect them? And maybe most intriguingly, and I won't say very much about this, just want to raise the question, I'll raise it again at the end, what does the infinitesimal view of quantitative genetic variation within populations, what does this imply, if anything, for how we go about understanding function in organisms? At the moment, trying to understand that through the detailed accumulation of, of knowledge of individual genes and the ways they interact through small pathways. Will that actually work if adaptations are actually built up through the accumulation of infinitely many, effectively infinitely many um, variants of small effect? So what's this infinitesimal model? Well, it's actually rather hard to say. And I became interested in this um, when writing a, really a review and a, a sort of mathematical um, exposition of the infinitesimal model with Alison Etheridge and, and Amandine Weber a few years ago. And one thing we discovered is that although the infinitesimal model is usually attributed to R.A. Fisher, um, you know, great founder of population genetic and of much of statistics, Fisher never actually used the term. The term infinitesimal model emerged around the 1970s and no one remembers where it came from. No one remembers who first used it. And in fact, even in the, in the literature, one can find lots of references to the infinitesimal model, but no clear definition. I hope we managed to produce a clear definition in, in our paper. So what is it? Well, it's a consequence of assuming that traits are influenced by very many genes of small effect. It's actually quite robust. It doesn't require very strict assumptions about the distribution or even degree of interaction of these genes. One can state it most clearly um, at the phenotypic level. So let's focus on you know, what we call the genetic value of 
an individual. That's simply its expected value for some trait. If we uh, average over environmental conditions, you can imagine a thought experiment where you just produced large numbers of genetically identical individuals and uh, measured their mean value. Well, there'll be some distribution of that in the population. We take two parents, um, which have you know, one or other value. We look at their offspring and the offspring crucially will vary. Okay, They'll vary in some distribution. And the infinitesimal model simply states that the offspring are distributed in a normal distribution with a fixed variance independent of the value of the parents crucially and with a mean halfway between the two parents. So a very, very simple model. And the variance here is generated by recombination. Although you've stated this more or less in a, in a phenotypic way, you, you can wonder where does the genetic variability between offspring comes from? Well, it comes from the fact that each of the gametes coming from the, each of the two diploid parents is produced by recombination. It reshuffles the genes in the parents and that reshuffling, that recombination generates genetic variability. And although I've said that the variance amongst offspring is independent of the parental traits, it does depend on the relatedness uh, of the two genomes coming together in meiosis. And to the extent that the parents are inbred, there'll be a reduction in variance, but we can predict that. We can predict that simply from the pedigree. So this independence of the variance amongst offspring from the values of the parents, which is a crucial simplification, that's simply a consequence of the fact that variation within a population is typically over a range much smaller than the possible range. So we can actually see that that is the case from the fact that if we select on a population, it will respond to selection for many, many generations and will change by 5, 10, 15 standard deviations, you know, as witnessed by the advances in agricultural yields. And so if we take a population, we know that from standing variation in that population, we can construct individuals which are way beyond the range in either direction. And therefore, the variation within the population that we see is much narrower than the range that is possible through selection. And that's essentially something we observe empirically. And that implies that the variation is due to many, many variants, each with small effect. So I'll just give a little bit of history here. Um, I mean, Darwin was writing and was arguing very, on very general grounds that adaptation really required the accumulation of variants of small effect. But he had a great obstacle, which was that he, well, not, no one else at the time knew how inheritance really worked. There was a general idea, it was some kind of blending process that offspring would be kind of the average of the two parents. But an engineer, Fleming Jenkin, and a, a mathematician, uh, Davis, shortly after Darwin had published, actually showed quantitatively, these were amongst the first quantitative papers in, um, in evolutionary biology, they showed that if this were the case, if there were blending inheritance, variants would decrease by a factor of half every generation. And so there would just not be enough variation for selection to work. And this was a major obstacle. Well, Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin, um, took up the large scale study of inheritance and amassed uh, you know, an enormous amount of data on all kinds of traits, including human height. And he showed that, that typically individuals will follow a normal distribution and crucially that the offspring would indeed follow a, a normal distribution, which seemed to be independent of the value of the parents. The variance would be independent of the value of the parents. Obviously the mean would be something like the average of the two parents. And he was very excited about this in a, a really remarkable 1877 paper. He, he described results of a, experiments that he did on um, the size of seeds. Um, and he posted these seeds to his friends and they raised up, you know, on quite a large scale, the offspring. And Galton said he was astonished to find the family variability of the produce of the little seeds to be equal to that of the big ones. But so it was, and I thankfully accept the fact. For if it had been otherwise, I cannot imagine from theoretical considerations how the problem could be solved. And the point he was making was that actually, given this simplicity, you could actually calculate the variance you expect at an equilibrium in a population. He actually did that calculation. And if it had been some other complicated relationship, it would have been a bit of a nightmare. So, you know, we're still thankfully accept the fact that the infinitesimal model really does make quantitative genetics simple. So just to, to give a, a, you know, to quickly spin through the history here, 
know, Galton developed what he called a law of ancestral heredity. It's rather hard to work out what he had in mind. It was sort of exposed verbally. But the next progress was really around 1900. Carl Pearson, a very uh, prominent mathematician, formalized Galton's statistical description, developed a lot of tools we use nowadays. But Pearson was embroiled in a really bitter argument with the early geneticist who'd rediscovered Mendel's work in 1900 and couldn't understand how that related to this old fashioned biometric biometry that Pearson was developing from Galton's foundation. And this was resolved in principle by R.A. Fisher in 1918 in a remarkable paper which showed that Galton's observations, Pearson's calculations were consistent with many genes of small effect and actually established in that paper um, the sort of beginnings of the infinitesimal model in its quantitative form. But quantitative genetics developed in a kind of obscure way um, with great you know, practical sophistication, but not being noticed very much by the rest of, of science and biology. It kind of reconnected with evolutionary biology in the 70s with work by Alan Robertson, Russ Landy, Michael Bulmer. And what I'll do now is just say briefly something about uh, one of Alan Robinson's very nice papers in 1960, which really connects quantitative genetics with the population genetics of discrete Mendelian variation. And Robinson was actually had in mind the practical question of what is the limit to selection? If we take a population and just keep selecting and selecting and selecting, how far can we get? Well, it's actually quite a simple answer. In any one generation, the change in mean is the product of the additive genetic variance, we call the A, and what's called beta, the selection gradient, which is simply the increase in fitness as a function of the trait. So we can imagine the trait uh, influencing fitness, a graph of fitness against trait will have a gradient, that's the selection gradient. Changing one generation is beta BA. If we have a population of fixed size, effective size NE, diploid individuals, then in every generation, a fraction one over two NE of variation is lost through inbreeding. And so, uh, the typical time for which variation persists is 2NE. If we have a population of 100 individuals, we can select for around 200 generations and then things will slow down. So the net change in mean is simply 2NE times beta BA. So it's a very simple prediction. And actually, it, it's quite robust. It turns out it applies even with gene interactions. So what matters are the variance components. Robertson derived it for the additive genetic component. We can have other variance components that introduces extra terms, but essentially the same result still applies. And what Robertson did was actually quite elegant. He was related it to the probability of fixation of the underlying alleles. And what his insight really was, was that if we think of an individual allele segregating in the population at some frequency P naught, then it's got some chance of fixing. If it was entirely neutral, its chance of fixing would equal its initial frequency. And the rate of change of the mean is, and in fact, the total change in the mean over the whole experiment is simply the probability of fixation of the allele minus its initial frequency. So if it's neutral, that's zero. But if it's certain to be fixed, then the maximum advance is proportional to one minus its initial frequency. And so it was known from work by Kimura at this stage that the probability of fixation has a certain simple form, depends just on n times s, population size times selection. If ns is zero, if things are neutral, then the uh, fixation probability equals P naught. But what matters is the gradient here the rate of increase of fixation probability with NS. And what Robertson did is show that if you take a linear approximation here, you recover the infinitesimal prediction from QG. And that implies then, crucially, that the assumption behind the infinitesimal model is that selection is weak. In other words, that N times S is small, that selection coefficients are you know, dominated by drift. And that what we're getting is a slight biasing away from neutrality. That's where the infinitesimal model, which is the foundation of practical quantitative genetics, that's where it comes from. And what's remarkable is that this works really well, implying that, you know, in our short-term selection experiments, alleles are close to neutral. So this is a, a survey by Weber and Diggins um, in actually an empirical paper in genetics, but they just looked at all the different um, selection experiments they could find in maize and mice and drosophila, and all kinds of different traits. These are these little points here. And they compared the change in mean over 50 generations with the change over one generation. And there's a prediction for this, which is not quite the ultimate limit. The ultimate limit is here to NE. But over 50 generations, actually, if you have a very large population, the ratio should be 50. You should just keep going with no loss of variation. Sorry. Um, the two lines here, the upper line is if you include a bit of mutation, we know roughly how much mutation there is. It doesn't make much difference over 50 generations. 
So the point is that this doesn't match perfectly, but it matches pretty well for biology. There's a pretty good fit of the infinitesimal model, and the discrepancy may actually be due to linkage and rather than selection. Okay, so this, this works pretty well, implying the underlying variation is close to neutral. So I'll be sort of wrapping up then with the question of, well, what form of selection would be most efficient? We've sort of seen some cases where selection is really strong, things happen quickly, you just fix the next allele, that's that. We see that most complex trait variation seems to be under this sort of more continuous selection, which could be rapid at the level of the trait, but implies rather weak selection at the underlying allelic variation. So if we want to ask what form of selection is most efficient, we have to have some metric for what we mean by progress, what we, how we measure progress. And the best way to do this, I think, was actually suggested by Kimura in 1961. And this is a measure of the gain of information. So what we do is compare the probability distribution of genotype frequencies with the distribution if there'd been no selection. And we think of selection as focusing this distribution in towards the fitter genotypes. So in the limiting case, if there's just one best genotype and if selection fixes that genotype, we measure the progress by one over the probability of seeing that if there were no selection. In other words, by its improbability. Selection is making progress if it's establishing an improbable set of gene frequencies. And so this is a, a measure of um, information closely related to Shannon's measure, um, which measures how far selection has compressed the distribution of genotypes. And this is a very general measure. So we can sort of see the sort of process by looking at a, a distribution of allele frequency trajectories. In the very simplest case, two alleles at one locus. One of these trajectories shows what happens to an allele that rises in one copy and gets established, may get fixed, may get lost. Of course, most of the things are lost down here. You don't really see them. Under selection, um, with in this case, NS is two, uh, we have a biasing towards the fitter allele, but it's not absolute, you, it can still be lost. And so what's happening is that over time, from generation one to generation 500, the distribution in red under selection is being biased away from the neutral distribution in blue, and that, in this example, fixes 0.8 bits of information. So then we can ask, you know, how can we most efficiently accumulate information in the population? And this graph shows on, on the x-axis, the fixation probability as we increase n times s. So we increase the strength of selection on individual alleles and that increases the fixation probability. So if we just want to fix the best allele, we just apply strong selection. But we have to think in terms of the cost and the cost here is, if you like, the reproductive variation, the variation in reproductive capacity we need. And this is measured by something called C, which you can think of as, as closely related to the variance in fitness. And this is something that's limited by how many offspring an organism can produce. So we have some constraint and we want to maximize our gain in information per constraint. And the point here is that if we just applied very strong selection and fixed the allele, we'd be wasting reproductive capacity. We could apply a tenth of selection and still fix the best allele. And it turns out that the most efficient way to do it in terms of bits per fitness variance is when selection is very weak. Um, if it's constant, we have this curve here. We can optimize things by saying, well, we can tune the selection so as to maximize the bits per cost um, by you know, increasing selection at the beginning and decreasing to the end in some clever way. We can do better, but still there is an upper bound, which is basically n bits per unit cost, n being the population size, the haploid population size. So actually there's a very general bound, which um, Michel Fledic, who's a student working at IST, recently um, derived, which says that very generally, I mean, we're making really no assumptions about how selection works, the increase in um, information is bounded by population size times cost. And so population size limits the rate at which selection can accumulate information. And really selection crucially is most efficient when alleles have infinitesimal effects. So this is quite counterintuitive. I mean, it means that, and I think this is the most disturbing conclusion, that selection is most efficient when it's least detectable. So I just very briefly, since I'm, I'm coming to the end now, say something about another issue, a related issue, which is not just how much progress can we make in terms of information accumulation, but how many different traits can we select? Can we select in any direction? We imagine this very high dimensional space of all the different morphologies and physiologies and so on of an organism, an enormously high dimension. How is it that selection has shaped 
a particular combination of traits with very many degrees of freedom. Well, the sort of quantitative genetic theory is sort of almost too simple. It says that as long as there's heritable variation in any direction, you'll make progress. But it's still true that in the short term, selection is constrained ultimately by the number of segregating alleles. If you have a population with, let's say, 10,000 alleles segregating, that's 10,000 different directions in which you can make progress. But in the long run, you can accumulate mutations at many, many sites. You can accumulate more complex mutations. And in principle, you could get to any feasible genotype. And one way to think about it is say, you know, think of mammals, there's us, there's mice, there's bats, they seem like enormously different, but we are connected by a chain of ancestral lineages, which were slightly different from each other. That's evolution, descent with modification. And so although we see almost unbridgeable gaps between present day species, they were bridged by evolution, by descent from common ancestry. And so, you know, in the long term, we can span an enormously high dimensional space. There's been a lot of argument stemming originally from Saul Wright, one of the founders of population genetics in, in the 30s, arguing that, well, population will get stuck at local adaptive peaks. And in particular, Wright introduced a model in which, you know, traits are um, determined by the sum of effects of plus minus alleles, many, many alleles. And he had the idea that, yes, a particular optimal trait could be produced by many different genotypes, plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, plus. There will be different adaptive peaks, though, and you might be stuck at an inferior genotype. There might be many, many ways to produce a certain phenotype. Some might be better than others due to pleiotropic side effects or whatever. So he was very concerned about this, but it turns out, as a, a nice paper recently by Laura Hayward and Guy Seller, showing, and this sort of comes from quite a long um, tradition of uh, work on how populations do respond to selection on polygenic variation. And this shows that if you have alleles of small effect, NS small particularly, and diverse effect, then you don't get stuck on adaptive peaks. This getting stuck is a consequence of assuming alleles with large effects, which mean that there will be gaps. It's hard to get from plus minus to minus plus. But in fact, if you have the infinitesimal worldview, that's not a problem. So I'll wrap up now just by, you know, laying out you know, four questions, um, and there are many other questions raised by this. Clearly, under the infinitesimal view, we may not be able to detect selection through its effect on DNA sequence, because the effect of selection is a slight biasing away from neutrality. We may be able to detect the aggregate effects, but not necessarily the specific effects at specific loci. We still don't know what maintains polygenic variation. The infinitesimal model implies it's simply neutral. That's probably not the case. But we don't know the strength of selection underlying polygenic variation. We don't know whether it's primarily maintained by a balance between mutation and selection. That's the most plausible explanation. We also still have a big gap between the way we think about short-term adaptation in terms of quantitative genetic variation in response to selection, depending on many, many alleles, versus long-term adaptation, where in the long run, we're looking at substitutions. But the idea here is that those substitutions are largely random. They're simply biased towards this or that phenotype. And finally, just to leave you then at the end with, I think the hardest question, which is what does all this imply for the way we study uh, function through looking at one gene at a time or interactions between small numbers of genes in pathways? Can we actually hope to build up an understanding of function as a whole through that sort of uh, mechanism? I, I don't think that's ruled out by any means by the sort of infinitesimal worldview. All we're saying under the infinitesimal model is that adaptations are built up by accumulation of variants of small effect. But at the end, we may end up with something where we knock out the gene and you're dead. That, of course, is the case for, most, for a large fraction of genes. Nevertheless, it suggests that there might be extensive diffuse function, as I call it. For example, promoters might not involve a single, you know, strong binding site where it's on or off, but they might involve the cumulative effect of a number of weak binding sites. Indeed, that seems to be the case in eukaryotes. How do we go about studying that kind of diffuse function? I think that's maybe as hard as it's, as it's been to study diffuse adaptation in this infinitesimal worldview. Thank you.